DC-3s are getting rare, folks. Why is that? Well, we're gonna find out today. This airframe was first flew in 1935, 85 years ago, and she's gonna go to work today. Where are all the DC-3s? Why are they getting hard to find? We're gonna find that out today. It's getting very hard to actually find a DC-3 for sale. Why is that? At one time they were everywhere and cheap. You can even get one for free. Now DC-3s are as rare as gold, actually. I forgot to say good morning. Minus 32 degrees Celsius. It is freezing, folks, but that Warbird is still working. People are actually working all around the world trying to find these aircraft that are coming up for sale, rescuing them, and uh, trying to, you know, maybe even make them into turbines. So today we're going to really go in and figure out why the value of the DC-3 has been skyrocketing in the last few years. Well, the DC-3 is a uh, war relic made 75 years ago, and still it is a very viable air transport in the world, especially for the remote regions and the jungle and tundras. So with the demand for that plane in that role, uh, it will always remain a very valuable aircraft. That's my buddy Hans. He literally wrote the book on searching the world for DC-3s. He knows his stuff. But right now, to get this all started, I wanna tell you guys what DC-3s are actually on the market right now uh, at the time of filming this video. And there's three, which is pretty convenient because all three are at different stages of restoration. So let's look at these now. The first DC-3 I want to touch on is the Clipper Tabitha May. It's out on the east coast of the United States, and this is one of the top of the line aircraft. It's going for just under $1 million. And we've seen this aircraft on Plane Savers. It came and visited us with the crew in Montreal when we we're getting DTD ready, but more on that a little bit later. So the second aircraft available is a mid-tier DC-3, which is out of New Zealand. It's for sale for $350,000. The third is a derelict DC-3 sitting in the States, and this aircraft is for sale for $15,000. Now, folks, all three of these airplanes, five, 10, 15 years ago, would have been half or even a third amount of money that they're asking for now. So what caused the price to rise recently? I wanna tackle the small items first, meaning the parts, which are very, very important, because if you wanted to buy a DC-3, you're gonna to have to get it flying, or keep it flying. So where are you gonna find the parts? Where did Buffalo get its parts? Some valuable lessons that I learned when we were down getting a DTD ready in Montreal is just the amount of parts and how hard it is to find some parts. Like this cowling right here is easy for us. We got lots of them. Uh, but if you were new to this DC-3 game, it's gonna be very, very hard. So my father spent years and decades and actually my whole childhood, I spent going to auction sales in the States. You gotta realize in the USA, there was many, many Air Force bases and just about all of them, well, all of them had DC-3s. And of course, anything that the Air Force is using, they had a massive supply of surplus parts. And these surplus parts went to surplus dealers. And as these people retired, the auctioneer, which was starving auction, would come in and uh, sell off their parts. And of course, all the people like myself or you, that was dealing DC-4s, DC-3s around the world to show up at these auction sales. Well, you know, you're going back 10, 12 years now on these and we started going to these auctions like 25 30 years ago and some of them were fairly large some of these auctions were like three rings going for three days Let's say we're buying a set of disc brakes like we got for the dc3 here you know uh if we had to pay fifteen hundred thousand dollars i mean we cry all night in our beer after the auction but now if you can get buy a set of those for twenty five thousand uh that's what you're going to pay so and there was a lot of stuff that was very very reasonable uh, that uh, we didn't realize at the time how reasonable it was. Like Steve Starman told me one time, when you leave here today, Joe, you won't be coming back because everything will be sold and this is just one more dealer you won't deal with anymore. 
the end of the sale, we usually had a, a truck full, I mean a 45-foot trailer full that kept us alive. You'd be very hard pressed to have operated these airplanes for that many years, for that many hours we fly a year without having gone to the Starman auction. So that air is pretty well over now. The surplus dealers are pretty well sold out. And I really miss it because um, we really enjoyed it. It was always a, a good trip that is better than a holiday. We bought out entire, entire inventories of parts just to have this ready. So if you're coming into a DC-3 for the very first time, you're not gonna have any parts. And parts, especially certifiable parts, are very, very, very hard to find. I can't stress that enough, which starts bringing up costs. Fighters are a completely different thing because they made a lot of parts for fighters, but nobody kept them because the fighters had really no use after the war. So a lot of stuff was scrapped. DC-3s, DC-4s, C-46s, they had value because they were hauling cargo. So here's the thing, the DC-3 at one point was worth a way more than say a Spitfire or a P-40 or Mustang. You probably get 10 or 12 uh, Spitfires for the cost of one DC-3. It's definitely not like that anymore. But here's the tricky thing, the DC-3 airframe is actually one of the most valuable Warbird aircraft airframes in the world. And I'm gonna have to explain this to you. Okay, so the economics of Warbirds deserves their own video. So let's just get caught up here. The reason why the DC-3 was successful for so many years was because during the war effort, they built so many airframes and in turn built a lot of parts. And because after the war, the aircraft found a niche in cargo, passengers, and you know, endless amount of jobs the DC-3 did. But aircraft like the Spitfire and P-40 and Mustang had no real jobs after the war. So even though the same amount of airframes were built, same amount of parts were built, those aircraft did not survive the 60s, 70s, 80s, and into the 90s like the DC-3 did. So the parts dealers that dealt with DC-3 parts survived by buying extremely cheap parts, selling it to operators like Buffalo Airways at a reasonable price. So as the economy of DC-3s was changing, the parts dealers that didn't adapt and move to more modern aircraft slowly went out of business. And this is where we went to the auctions and got all these spare parts cheap, which caused a secondary boom for DC-3s in the cargo capacity, and this is where Buffalo Airways in the 90s and 80s survived, is off the second boom of cheap parts. But new operators of DC-3s didn't have any chance of getting parts, which meant that more modern aircraft now had a foot in the door to get in and the DC-3s started waning. So nobody's operating DC-3s, you can't get parts. Lots of airframes. The airframes started becoming a nuisance to airports. There was DC-3 airframes everywhere and they started being scrapped. And this is the point where most aircraft die. They, they just outlive their usefulness. And again, I'm dumbing this down, but parts and airframe availability is a huge issue in an airframe's life cycle. But the DC-3 had two tricks up its sleeve that a lot of aircraft didn't have. The number one thing, of course, is the historical value. These aircraft flew in D-Day. They saved the world in World War II, and they deserved to be saved and deserved to be put in museums and flying museums and shown all around the world. The second thing it had is Basler turbo conversion. Yes, the company that is putting turbines on DC-3s, given the DC-3 the ability to last the next 85 years, they went around and started collecting all the low time airframes. They've collected over a hundred airframes, about 70% of them have already been turbinized and they went around and sucked up some of the supply. So the demand for turbines, the demand for warbirds really hit the supply. Put that into nuisance airframes that have been scrapped due to you know delinquent owners or just space or new requirements and that folks is just simple supply and demand but basler is an opportunity for the warbirds as well anybody that's interested in dc3s and in, the first thing i do is is find out what basler's doing and what they got and what they got for surplus because if they take a if you're restoring an airplane back to original and you want the original engines and equipment on it, when they take an airplane in to turbinize it, 
they take all that off and they'll sell it to you. Uh, and quickly, because people are going to be asking, uh, why don't you just sell the parts? I sell lots of parts. Uh, lots of people phone here. I don't know how many calls we get a day for parts. And if we have a, an extra amount of them, I definitely sell them. I've sold a lot of parts for, uh, but normally I like to trade, you know, because uh, like, you know, see that King Air over there? That one, that King Air right there used to be a whole bunch of DC3 parts that were traded. So, so that King Air over there, you know, so uh, we may not sell, but we're certainly willing to trade. Okay, folks, you've made it to the video this far. Thank you. Congratulations. I'm going to get to it now. Say you found a Spitfire airframe. You're super lucky. Not a lot of them survived after World War II, but you found one. You bought it for $100,000, and now you're going to restore it. And you're looking good because once it's done, you can sell this airplane for one to two million dollars. So the potential airframe value of that Spitfire is two million dollars. Now look at the DC-3. You're going to say, well, you know, a very high-end one is worth a million dollars and, you know, you can buy one now, an airframe for 15000 So you can kind of say the potential airframe value of a DC-3 is a million dollars, but it's not. Look at the Basler, folks. Baslers are selling up towards $9 million. So that means the potential airframe value of a regular DC-3 is $9 million. Sure, you got to put a lot of money in it to make it $9 million, but that DC-3 can go to work and earn you money. And let's be honest, folks, the only way that Spitfire is going to make you money is if you sell it for more than you bought it for. That Basler can go to work and continue earning money. And in turn, all these years later, folks, you cannot keep the DC-3 down. We are now in the third boom of the DC-3. 24 years from now, in the year 2044, most of the airframes still existing of the DC-3 will come to 100 years of age. That means that with the, the current conversions that they do, from the DC-3 to turbo prop, it is quite sure that a number of them will come to that age. And that makes it the longest living transport in the world. There is no train, car, boat or plane that can even come close to the 100 years of existence of the DC-3. So it makes it the most legendary aircraft of all time. If you have a DC-3 derelict story, please let me know in the comments. I would love to hear from you. If you wanted to see that DC-3 take off from this morning without me talking and ruining the audio, I've uploaded it right here. Check it out. And also, please check out Hans' Dakota Hunter book. This is not an ad. I absolutely love this book. And remember, every airplane deserves the chance to fly again.